If someone were to ask you, who are you looking out from behind your eyes? What is the criteria that you use to identify your identity in responding to such a question? Well, let's dive right in. I'm going, we're going to explore this subject and we're going to discover things like Jesus Christ and His glory and the connection of covenant and communion and why the preeminence of Jesus Christ is so important in determining our identity. If you've got a Bible there, turn to John chapter 14, verse 8. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. And Jesus looked at Philip and he says, Philip, have I not been with you so long and you don't know me? Whoever has seen me, said Jesus, has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me? The words that I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. So Philip was confronted as a disciple of Jesus Christ by the reality of who Jesus was and who his Father was and the oneness that the Father and Jesus Christ share. I in you and you in me, and Jesus says, in that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. So how do we understand as we explore this subject of our identity, as well as the identity of Jesus Christ, how do we understand a Christ-centered orientation, if we're looking at the Bible, with an Old Testament narrative? Because the person of Jesus Christ is witnessed from the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets. And we'll explore that in just brief today. And I hope you find this message of encouragement, of strength and blessing. I remember as a boy receiving a small Bible. And that Bible came with the Psalms, the Proverbs and the New Testament. It wasn't a complete Bible. Conspicuous from its non-inclusion were the, the Prophets and the Torah. They were excluded. Now for whatever theological reason... The New Testament Psalms and Proverbs were in the small Bible, but the bulk of the Bible wasn't there. And this is a tragedy because the New Testament witness of Jesus Christ is founded on the historical record from Genesis right up to the Christ event, based on the law, the first five books of the Bible, and the prophets. I'll give you an example from the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, the angel speaking to Joseph said, She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then Matthew goes on to say, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. And this is the quote, Behold, the virgins shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Which, pro which prophet was this? This was Isaiah. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 10. Again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God, and let it be deep as Sheol, or as high as heaven. So God is asking the king here, you can ask a question of the Lord. Now it can be as high as heaven, or it can be the lowest depths of the grave. You have the prerogative of asking any question of that kind of magnitude. So what question would you ask the Lord? Well, I have said, I'm not going to put the Lord to the test. So the Lord then says, the Lord himself will give you a sign in verse 14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. In other words, if you were to explore a particular subject from the heights of heaven to the lowest points of the grave, hell, what event would you inquire about? The birth of Jesus Christ was, was highlighted by the prophet Isaiah. Now John also, very interesting to read the, the, the narrative of the, the Gospels as well as the epistles where references to what the prophet spoke, references to the Messiah in the Torah 
are very, very powerful and extraordinarily encouraging and extremely insightful that the rock of Jesus Christ is based on the template of the Old Testament. And that's why the disciples saw the references and quoted those particular scriptures. Jesus says in John chapter 6 verse 45, it is written in the prophets and they will be taught by God. And then Jesus says, everyone who has learned and heard from the Father comes to me. And so we turn to Isaiah again. Isaiah chapter 5, 54 verse 13. All your children shall be taught by the Lord and great shall be the peace of your children. So John takes this one line out of Isaiah as he recalls Jesus' words, and they shall be taught by God. And then Jesus shows the connection that he is the Son of God, that he came to the Father, and that he returned to the Father. So John introduces us to the Son of God, and he does so by using the word logos, or the word, which is translated in English, logos means in Greek word, the highest form of wisdom, of understanding of the highest form. And John begins in verse, John chapter 1, verse 1. Basically, he says, the word was God, the word was with God, and the word was God. And in verse 14, he says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ, full of grace and truth. So let's explore what the disciples knew about Jesus, how they came to understand who Jesus was, and how the prophets pointed towards this Christ Messiah event. Because there are several things that are very important here. One, it'll help us orient our walk in a godly manner. We will understand not only our identity, but we'll be able to be oriented with a strong Christ-centered theology. It'll better help us understand who Jesus Christ was, who Jesus Christ is, the Son of God. Jesus says, in that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. And so many places through the Gospels we see where Jesus explains that he has a oneness with the Father, a covenant communion oneness. Let us make man in our image and our likeness is the first voice that we hear in Genesis. And then Jesus says, you have are to have that same relationship with me. Come to me, says Jesus, all who are hungry, um, labor and weary, and I'll give you rest. If anyone's thirsty, said Jesus, come to me. He said to the Pharisees, you refuse to come to me. And the Pharisees says, well, we worship God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they didn't realize that the Son of God who came from the Father, the express image of the Father, was standing in their image. So it's very easy to be blind to the very true word of God, both literal written down and personified in Christ. We will value, once we understand who Jesus Christ is, the price that's been paid for our redemption. Redemption, that's the, the price that a slave was bought. Because over our head, we had the Damocles sword of certain death. All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. All have the death penalty on us. A soul that sins shall die. And Jesus Christ entered our world, the world that he spoke into existence, that he sustains by the power of his word, and he paid for our sins, absorbing our sins and attributing to us his righteousness. And so we value the preeminence of Jesus Christ in a really, well, forever and ever and ever and ever, eternally. Another thing that it does when we understand who Jesus Christ is, therefore understand who we are, is that we have a testimony. And we're able to articulate the testimony based on the testimony of Jesus. The saints are those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. But also in our own words. Because we believe the testimony of Matthew, Mark, John, Peter, Paul and others. And Jesus prayed for those who would believe in Jesus on account of their word. And so we too, as disciples of Jesus, are called to have a testimony. I believe because, and then we can articulate this faith in our own personal words, based on the, the pillar and the rock of scripture, based on the person of Jesus Christ. We'll also be able to experience on a whole new level communion, covenant, companionship, 
fellowship when Jesus says, in that day you will know that I'm in the Father and you in me and I in you. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus says in Revelation to the church that didn't have Jesus, those who were listening to this Holy Spirit, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me, enjoying a level of fellowship that's bridged by covenant. And Jesus Christ is our Lord, our Saviour, our King, our Advocate, but he's also our brother and friend. And if you're called by Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and you're a follower of Christ, we share the same Father. Therefore, we go on our knees and say, Our Father in heaven, holy be your name. And our identity is articulated in our testimony. And so we live by the power of the Holy Spirit, the very personal presence of God in us, the Father and Christ. That's why John said in his epistle, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And that's very powerful and very reassuring because we live in a world of brokenness, of adversarialness, of trial, of temptation, of wickedness, of sin, of depravity, of transgression. That's the world we live in. Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, tribulation. He said, take heart, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's why we are called to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who began a good work in us and will bring it to completion in a very mighty and powerful and reassuring way. Another scripture comes from, very powerful, John recorded what Jesus had said and Jesus said in John chapter 12 verse 41, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. So here we are, another direct messianic reference in the book of Isaiah quoted by John. So let's turn to this passage in Isaiah and we find this in Isaiah chapter 6 beginning in verse 1. In the year that King Isaiah died, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And he hears the seraphim calling out, the angelic beings that are there. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is filled with his glory. So Isaiah witnesses the glory of the Lord the sitting on his throne. Very few people have had privy to have the fabric of time, matter and space torn apart and look into the glories of heaven. Very few people, we should largely shield it from it because we can't really deal with it. And John's testimony in the book of Revelation, he also hears the angels singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God who was and is to come. And they're praising the Lamb. And Isaiah heard these words. Now if we turn to um, continue in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 4, Isaiah says, and the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And then Isaiah senses a problem. He says, woe is me, for I am lost. He recognizes his inadequacy in, in front of a holy, righteous, pure God. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. I've been defiled by the things that I've spoken. Jesus said to the Pharisees, a man is not defiled by the things he eats, by what comes out of his mouth. And then Isaiah says, For I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So Isaiah refers to the one who was sitting on the throne as a king. And in Revelation we hear the angelic choruses singing, praise to the glorified Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, forever and ever and ever. And I think that's one of the reasons I really love Handel's Alleluia Chorus, because it speaks into that emotional power of the angelic chorus, forever and ever, honouring the great God who by his power and his will created all things and sustains it by the power of his word. They all exist by him, through him and for him. And we are privileged to be knowing that having a glimpse of this glory by the Holy Spirit in us, a glory that we carry in our person, a glory of a living hope, a certain hope of what will be revealed in us. So Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is an image bearer of the Father in a very powerful way. And scripture tells us that we must be image bearers of Jesus Christ. 
He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We are to be Jesus' hands, ears, eyes, heart, to love our enemies, to do good to those who persecute, to pray for those who malign you, so that Jesus said, so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Just like Jesus is a son of the heavenly Father, firstborn of many brethren. Scripture tells us that Jesus Christ always existed with the Father as one, that he came to the far, from the Father, that he spoke the Father's words, he did the Father's will. He was an image bearer of the Father, inasmuch as we are called to be an image bearer of Jesus Christ. We learn from Scripture that not only did Jesus Christ come from the Father, that he returned to the Father. And in the book of Revelation, we read where he sat down on his Father's throne. And we read elsewhere where Jesus one day will put everything in subjection to his Father after he's brought everything in subjection to himself. The preeminence of Jesus Christ pervades both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So I can't imagine why a Bible was distributed when I was a boy that only came with the Psalms, Proverbs and the New Testament. The whole word of God is necessary for the whole word and to be spoken the truth in love. Paul wrote to those at Colossae, Colossians chapter 1 verse 15, and he takes us again, as the book of Hebrews does, right into the describing to those at Colossae some 2,000 years ago who Jesus Christ is. Listen to these words. Speaking of Jesus, Paul writes that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him, and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything Jesus Christ might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether on heaven or on earth. And how did he do this? by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Let's flick over now to John chapter 6, verse 46. Jesus says, Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. Well, who is from God? Listen to this narrative. He has seen the Father. So who has seen the Father? The one who is from God. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life, says Jesus. So now Jesus is talking about he who's been to the, seen the Father, and then he draws her attention to himself that I am the bread of life. He says, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. Verse 50, this is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. And Jesus says, whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I give for the world is my flesh. Jesus draws a very powerful connection here. Listen to some other powerful connections where Jesus overtly speaks of his identity. John chapter 8, verse 58. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now the Pharisees around him said, You're not yet 50 years old. How can you say you've seen Abraham? They had a problem. They did not, not, not only didn't they, they did not recognize the Messiah. They were instrumental in having him crucified and killed. John chapter 16, verse 28, Jesus says, I came from the Father and have come into the world and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. In John chapter 17, in this epic prayer, Jesus prays for himself. He prays then for his disciples and then he prays for all of those like you and me who would believe on account of their word. But in the prayer, in the beginning of the prayer where he prays for himself, he says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So putting all these scriptures together, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God and the word was God. 
let us make man in our image and after our likeness, we gain a greater sense based on Jesus' words and the testimony of Scripture, both through the law and the prophets and the epistles and the, the, the gospels, of really who Jesus Christ is. And if we are to have this one covenant relationship with Christ, we are identified not by our skin colour, not by our gender, not by ethnicity or our skill base or what we do or don't do. We're identified by Jesus Christ. That's why out of the waters of baptism we're raised a whole new creation. We might have started this earth as an earthly creation, only known by the Father. But what God is doing in us through Jesus Christ by being spirit-formed and spirit-filmed is a mighty work. And Scripture tells us that all of creation yearns and longs for the revealing of the sons of God. Up until now, we talk about the Son of God. But John also tells us we are now children of God. And the glory that will happen when we are raised to see Jesus face to face, that all of creation are waiting for the sons of God to be revealed, his children. So understanding who we are, because we understand who Jesus Christ is, means that when we pray to our Father, we pray in Jesus' name. We acknowledge our covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. We acknowledge his lordship. We acknowledge his preeminence. We recognize his advocacy in bringing us into the Father's presence. And the price that he paid willingly in our redemption. The death penalty was on our heads. And he took that death penalty. He was the only one who could and the only one who was willing to because we serve a righteous, holy, just God whose wrath is just, whose righteousness is just, beyond human understanding. You know, we hear in the New Testament so clear, echoed in Peter, there's no other name under heaven by which men may be saved. There's no other option, there's no other life, there's no other solution, there's no other religion. But we are called into a relationship that leads to glory. And so because of this commitment, in Christ, this covenant, our lives today reflect a higher glory, a higher reality. So when we come before God in prayer and you spend time in the Father's presence, you carry in your image more of the glory that awaits to be revealed. When Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments, he had a, a momentary glimpse of the Lord. And when he came down from that mountain, he was glowing with a chicane, a glory of some kind, that he had to wear a veil because it was too confronting for the carnal ancient Israelites. On the transfiguration experience, when Jesus took Peter, John and James, his closest disciples, up on the mountaintop, and there was Jesus transfigured into glory, and with him were the quintessential representatives of the law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah. When they came down from that mountain, Peter, John and James would have carried in their being a sense of glory, of higher identity, of greater aspiration of who Jesus Christ is. Because the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And we would do well to have ears that hear. He that has an ear, says the Lord to the churches, let him hear what the Spirit says, what speaks to us of who, who we are and what our identity is, and what the glory is that awaits. Whatever we say and whatever we do then is carried in that glory. We reflect Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote, he said, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus with thanksgiving. Do we speak as, an, as, a, as the arms, ears, mouth, heart of Jesus Christ in everything we do and say? Scripture says that men will give account of every idle word they speak. But if we speak according to the will of Jesus, drawing on him as a vine does from the branch, from the, as, as a branch does from the vine, then our words will be godly words. Our words will be holy words. Our words will be words of glory. And with the, we read in scripture where, I think it's Isaiah, where God says, the words that I speak never return to me empty. And if we are custodians of the words of Jesus Christ, then our words will carry weight. 
and no one will be able to refute our testimony because we carry in our body, our heart and soul, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1 verse 7. Peter writes, In praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Then he says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. That's powerful. That's faith at work. That's the prayer of Jesus that we would believe on account of the testimony of the witnesses of Scripture. That though we have not seen him, says Peter, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. So, can I ask you this question again? Who are you really looking out from behind your eyes? Where do you obtain your identity? How do others see you? Very interesting when I asked that question because Jesus said to his disciples, who do men say that I am? It was important for Jesus to clarify that in the, in the listening of his disciples. Who do men say that I am? And some people said, well, they said, some people say you're the prophet. Some people say you're Elijah. And Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter, one of the disciples, was the most they had spoken. He said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Peter's confession is very powerful. He didn't understand that through his own understanding, as Jesus said. It was the spirit of his father in him that helped him to recognize what the Pharisees couldn't, the highest religious order of the day. You, me, those who are believers, are a child of God now. Our Heavenly Father is our Heavenly Father. We are united by family. God is family. God is one but God is also family and God is looking forward to the revealing of us in the time of glory. When you were raised from baptism, scripture tells us that you were a new creation. You are a new creation today. 1 John 3, 2, John says, Beloved, we are now God's children and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because... We shall see him as he is. No longer just a few prophets occasionally over the eons of time. 6,000 years of your recorded human history. Just four or five people who saw the glory of heaven. Saw the Lord sitting on his throne. One day every eye will see him. One day every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. These are the promises of Scripture. That's what identifies me. And that's what should identify you and identify us as family. Family in God. Last Scripture for the day from John chapter 16, verse 33. This is the reality in which we operate. Jesus says, These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Then he says, In this world you'll have trouble. You'll have tribulation. He said, Be of good cheer. He said, Take heart. Another, another translation. I have overcome the world. So we are children of God. While our eyes and hearts are focused on Jesus Christ, we can be courageous and strong and leave our mark in this society as much as the prophets of old, as those people in the Torah like Noah and Abraham, faithful people, men and women, who stood and lived in their times courageously who spoke none other than the word, Lord's words, and those words never returned them empty. I encourage you to run the race with joy. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the one who began a good work in you, and exult in your identity in Jesus Christ. Remember the words as we sign out today. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, on behalf of Message Week Ministries, I'm John Classic. <laughs>